Hello, lovelies. Welcome to the Fat Joy Podcast, where we talk each week about how to flourish in an anti fat world. I'm Sophia, a fat person and professional coach who loves talking to other fat people about what it's like to live within oppressive systems that marginalize our bodies and how we still dare to have the audacity and courage to reach towards our collective liberation and embrace our joy. Please know this is an adult content podcast, so there will be swears, we will be talking about harms we've experienced, and we will be rebelling against diet culture, anti-fatness, ableism, racism, etc. If you'd like to support the Fat Joy podcast and get bonus content as a thank you, please check us out at patreon.com slash fatjoy. I am so glad you're here with us. Enjoy. Hello, lovelies, and welcome back to the Fat Joy podcast. Today, I have someone who I've considered a fat elder for many years. We have Vinny Wellsby with us. And Vinny, I first encountered years and years ago. I wish I could remember exactly how, but it was when I was first going through my own fat liberation journey, this uncovering, unveiling, unlearning of all these things that I thought was true about my body. And Vinny, you were a huge influence on me. And I also admired that you were a badass business person as well, because you were running your own business around this work. And I'm just so thrilled to get to talk to you again um, after it's been a few years since we've spoken. And I'm so excited to talk to you, have you here with us. So thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Sophia. And I'm I'm absolutely dying on the description of being a fat elder. It's like just filled my soul with happiness that I like I said before that someone thinks that I'm <laughs> that I'm a fat elder. But then you did say you've been doing this work for a long time. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, eight years. You have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've influenced so many people. There's so many people I talked to. I was just telling you before we start recording, someone who I was like chatting with used to work for you and so like you're really you're people know who you are you're you're really you're in you are in <laughs> the liberation community <laughs> as you deserve to be your work is amazing um if anyone has not checked out Vinny's social feeds please do I'm often resharing them because they're just so informative so beautiful um so anyway before I gush even more and more uh Vinny tell us a little bit about yourself yeah, so um, I my name's Vinny, as you know. My pronouns are they, them. I'm a non-binary fat person. Um, if you're thinking, like, where the fuck is that accent from? I am a British-Irish person, but I live in Vancouver, Canada, which is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, Squamish, Slavertooth, and Musqueam nations. Um, in my work, I help people unlearn anti-fat bias, um, and I do that through uh, consulting, educating. Uh, I'm a TEDx speaker, got a book, got a podcast, and like set, share stuff on my Instagrams, all that type of stuff. Yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I love it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to my second question that I always ask, but because you mentioned the TEDx talk, I just want to take a little segue. Can you tell people what you did? Because <laughs> again, this is one of those early moments for me where I was like, oh, fat women can do that. At that point, you were identifying as she, her. And uh, I was like, what? So please tell them what you did on stage. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of my TEDx talk, I took my clothes off and revealed a sparkling blue bikini and did a bit of a dance and danced a bit like a twat because I'm not, not good dancing, but it was joyful and it was so much fun. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. And everyone gave me a standing ovation and was screaming and stuff. So, yeah. I mean, and when, what year was that? 26, 8, 16, 2018. Time is weird. Like, cause I'm like, it was like two years ago, but then the pandemic's fucked everything up and that's like missed time. Right. So I think maybe was it 2016? Oh my God. Was it that long ago? It, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Cause that's about when I was starting my unlearning. I was around, I was, I'm 42 now. So I was like 36 in 2016. I'm Googling this. I can't believe it has been 2016. Let me find it. Yeah. And you're right. That's when I was um, still identifying as a woman, and my name was uh, Victoria, not Vinnie. So four years ago. So that's 2018, isn't it? 
It's so good. Definitely go watch it. There's a link to it on Vinny's website. So if you want to see it, it's brilliant. Um, all right. Now we'll get to the question that I always ask second. Coming back from my little tangent what is, what is your relationship to the word fat? Oh, well, I love it. Well, my business is called Fierce Fatty. And I'm very uh, specifically use the word fatty because that is such a powerful word for me and for many people because Previously to me uh, coming into fat liberation, that word was the worst thing that someone could use against me. Like I would rather be anything, you know, I'd rather, um, you know, have a terrible personality, you know, be known as a kitten murderer, you know, what, you know, whatever. But being called fat would literally be a knife to my heart. And, uh, and when I discovered fat liberation and, uh, you know, the message that, it's okay to be fat. I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? And now that word for me is just um, uh, joy and strength and um, community and um, fun and softness and all sorts of different things that the reality that fat is this awesome thing. Yeah, absolutely. I was looking at your website earlier today before recording and there's some, there was maybe it might have been even been on the home homepage, but it was like, hello, fatty. And it was so interesting because I noticed I was like, oh, oh, right. Like it, I still had a tiny little, and I'm always so surprised when that happens because I think, yeah, I've done this work for years. Like I'm good. I'm a fat woman. I have a podcast called Fat Joy. Like, but there was still that little twinge of the, the, the confrontingness of it's not a word, but the way it confronted me. And I was like, I wonder if maybe it's because it's the fatty, like, hey, fatty. And so there was something anyway, I just I noticed and I thought how interesting and how beautiful also that you're just like, I am mean, this is this is my business. Fierce fatties. And that gets to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so interesting that you had that twinge. because It just goes to show how powerful uh those words can be on our brains, even though intellectually you know what it means in, you know, the deep part of you is like, oh, that means I'm bad. Right. There is still this little, little thing. Yeah, I know. I know. It was, it was really interesting. Um, I'm, I would love to know, Vinny, you, you mentioned like when you discovered fat liberation, do you remember, was this, was that in itself a bit of a journey or was there a moment? Like when, a moment. I remember it specifically because it was so shocking. Being in bed with my then partner, um, reading Reagan Chastain's blog, Dances with Fat, and um, reading this, the information on fat. You, you can be fat and healthy and you can't lose weight and things like that. And being, you know, turning to my boyfriend, being like, did you know? Like, what? Holy shit. And just being so excited and him just being like, what? what's going on? And you know, I just have it perfectly in my mind that moment because it was so like, it was just a switch that went off. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. Done. Wow. That quickly. Oh my gosh. I'm very jealous of that. It was that quick. So what, so it was that quick. And, and then what was the fallout? Then what happened? Well, then I was, uh, then it was kind of like, a, obviously I didn't know anything and was still really deeply, um, fat phobic myself but um from there i just kept i was just ravenous for for consuming content and i think i read um health at every size and was just like oh my god and i think what had, what had happened is that i had done lots of i've gone to i had gone to, to therapy for years and i'd done lots of sort of stuff about feminism and it was just like this makes sense and i'd also spent years trying to be thin and i knew i had that self confidence to know that i am um I trust myself. I trust that I am trying my hardest to lose weight and it's not working. And so I believe that this is true because I know that I uh, am a, a hardworking person. And even just saying that hardworking, I'm like, oh, that's white supremacy. But, um, and, and so from there, I was just sort of mo mostly talking about confidence in when I first started my business, like confidence stuff. And, um, and then just, continued my own journey of learning, learning, learning and consuming content and all that type of stuff to really get it. 
And how long was it before you op- like you started your own business? Well, so I was doing, so I was in recruitment at the time and I was doing career coaching, like helping people, like how to write a resume and all that type of stuff. And then it was kind of like, um, focusing to, to women and helping women with confidence. Cause I was like, okay, so I can see I'd been in recruitment for like nine years at that point, And I could see that there was a difference in the way that women perceived themselves versus a men. Um, and at the time I wasn't thinking about gender diverse people. Um, cause I didn't know. And, and so then it switched into more instead of career stuff, general confidence. And then from confidence, it turned into body acceptance from body acceptance it turned into radical fat liberation and it was like a journey of you know the light version of it and the kind of watered down I don't want to scare anyone and then now I'm like I don't care I'm coming out you know with my tits swinging fat liberation love it Ted swinging fat liberation. Yes. Yeah. That's very similar to my journey. When we first um, connect, like I'd been following you and then um, we connected and I think, I think I was on your podcast. I think I have that on my YouTube somewhere <laughs> way back um, because that was again years ago. Um, I, w- I was also doing what I was calling body confidence coaching. And then I was I get this softer, softer version. I, at that point though, I, I was very, I, maybe this is a journey a lot of people can relate to. That's why I think it's so interesting to talk about because for me it was this thought of, oh, okay, my I'm not wrong, basically. I'm not broken. I keep getting these messages that I'm fat, that I'm lazy, that there's something wrong with me. But I know that's not true. How do I reconcile those things? And then slowly as I kind of continued learning, there was when, like what you described with that moment of, oh, this just makes sense. Okay, so this is... And I went into body positivity and then started to learn about actual, the kind of underpinnings of that, that deeper level, which is basically the anti-oppression work and anti-fatness and really words like weight stigma and thin privilege and just, and I was, it was, there was like a, there was a pretty, I, I don't know if it's a predictable, but having talked to many people about this, it seems like there is this kind of predictable path we walk to get deeper and deeper, deeper into the root of it. And then, I don't know about you, but I pretty much live in constant anger um, at systemic oppression these days. <laughs> so, I, you know, where when I was doing body positivity, it didn't feel like that. Now I'm like, oh shit, I now see the world. Like I took whatever pill on the matrix and now I actually really see the world in a different way. Still from a place of privilege as a white person. Um, but yeah, so differently now. And I'm wondering if that's you. Yeah. Yeah. The way that I see it is that um, when I was teaching about body confidence and body positivity, I was colluding with um, white supremacy in the fact of I was saying, this is a you problem, fat person. As opposed to a systemic issue. And so, um, yeah. And so I think unlearning that piece of no shit fat people don't, aren't confident. Um, it's not their fault. And I wasn't, I wasn't thinking, Hey, fatty, it's your fault. I wasn't, but it was in the back of my mind of you can change your reality if you really believe. Um, but then, you know, through experience seeing that actually sometimes that's not true because fat people are going out into the world, um, saying, I'm, you know, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling confident. And then someone's shouting out their car window, like, fuck you. Right. Or someone's not hiring them for a job or, you know, or they're not getting the healthcare they need. And it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't think it doesn't matter if you love yourself or accept your body, because I think that I do believe that if you are not actively hating yourself, then you're able to advocate for yourself better because you think you deserve um, you know, good treatment. Um, so I think it is important for us to unlearn anti-fat bias. Um, but what's more important is that we never had it in the first place. And I think that's the work that we're doing now. And I think that's more, that's less colluding with white supremacy. A hundred percent. You just worded it so much more beautifully than I did. Yes. (laughs) Agree. (laughs) Co-sign that. Um, (laughs) Yeah. You mentioned that you were sitting beside your partner when you were reading this original Reagan Chastain information. You had this big realization. 
Uh, what was the impact on them, your friends, your family? I'm always very interested on the impact of becoming liberated on those and the impact on those closest tasks. I've had a very rocky situation as I've claimed um, and myself and set boundaries and, you know, so what was that like for you? So interesting. And actually, this is such a great segue to what we're talking about in today's episode. So my uh, my then partner, um, he was um, a science guy. And so um, and he comes from a family of uh, super fat people or, or very large people. Right. And he's he's a straight size, he you know, straight size kind of muscular guy. So I don't know what genetics happened there, but that's what happened. And, um, and so he had that personal experience of fatness, but also deep, deep, um, anti-fat bias living in his, in his brain. And so when I was like, Hey, by the way, you can be fat and healthy. He was like, I don't know about that. And I was like, that's okay. Read this book, health at every size, and you'll see all the science. Um, and he refused to, and it actually made our relationship break down because he was just like, I can't get on board with this. I think that you're delusional or um, I, I think that this is just not true. And But then he refused to look at the science so that he could, you know. He needed to like hold on to his own beliefs in that way. Yeah. And that was like when we were in, we were in couples therapy and I'm just like, just read the fucking book. <laughs> He's like. He's like, no, you're going to collapse my world. Believe. Yeah, exactly. And um, and he'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But he just never did. And then our relationship ended. Um, and also um, a couple of years prior to that, he had conv- uh, confessed to me that he was uh, less attracted to me because I had put on a little bit of weight, like tiny amount of weight. And we'll, we'll talk about that more. Um, but then with my wider family and friends, I actually lost a lot of friends because they were so committed to dieting and anti-fatness and all that type of stuff. And it wasn't like a, you know, uh, happened overnight. Like one day I went into work and I was like, fuck you, everybody. You talk about diets, you're dead to me. It was kind of like a slowly drifting away of, I know it's not safe to spend time with these people and they are not commit, you know, they are not interested in, in, in changing. And that's fine. Um, with my family, uh, my mum was, uh, always kind of, um, she needs, she called herself the fat one in the family. Um, she's not, she's a very small, um, a little Irish lady. And, and so I was a lot taller and, and, and obviously fat. And so I was th- thought that I was, you know, a giant beast of a child. And anyway, so through many years of discussions and stuff, she is, uh, pro fat. Love, she's like totally into it love it perfect you know really supportive she says she re- is really regretful that she um did lots of things and prescribed weight loss to people when she was a nurse and all that type of stuff and um what what swayed her what swayed her how how did she get there i think just lot many many conversations with me and then many like boundary setting and uh she actually flew from ireland to canada to watch me do my ted talk and i think you know i think you can't help but soak that stuff up yeah (laughs) yeah you can't help but soak that stuff up right and i think as she as she's got older she's just become more chill in in lots of different ways and she's she's a very kind person and she thought that she was saving me from a a bad life if I was a fat person, you know. So that was her trying to be kind, but it was obviously didn't work out like that. And um and luckily um we've got a, a fantastic relationship where we can talk about anything, you know. That's such a gift, Vinny. Wow. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Um and I don't think if I hadn't um found fat liberation that would have happened because I would have always just been uh have that barrier of she's saying things or doing things that make me feel bad and I'm not able to articulate why they make me feel bad or I would have agreed with her you know because I'd be in diet culture too um I have six siblings and one of my sisters uh she refuses to stop using the o words stop saying stigmatizing things and unfortunately our relationship ended because of that and so I had to set 
that um that boundary that I I can't have her in my life and it wasn't just that like that was the final you know it was years of stuff but and so I mean in regards to what happened you know uh, great things and not so great things you know I lost a lot of people and also gained better relationships and more authentic relationships and loving caring relationships so I wouldn't change it I agree. Again, very similar to my own story <laughs> with with that, the shift and, and the depth of relationship now, the deep understanding, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, m- my friends that I do have are so informed. They do their own work around oppression in general. I was, I'll share a little story, an example of this. I was at a friend's wedding in the summer and I was talking to a really interesting um, woman who is a human rights lawyer doing really cool work uh, in Canada, um, like at a big firm. So some, you know, just and <laughs> I said something like, uh, I think she was asking kind of what I do. And I said, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm a coach, but I, what I'm really passionate about is this work that I do around anti-fatness and weight stigma and, you know, you're in human rights. One of my big beefs and what I don't understand is why body size is not protected. And the super educated woman who does tons of work in like anti-oppressive spaces, unfortunately, my bestie was beside me, looks at me and goes, well, and use the O word, uh, which I'm going to say just for a fact, she said, well, obesity is a disease Ooh. and like straight and I was like like mid sip of a drink and I was like uh like one of those class uh, the hol- the wedding cocktail and I was like oh and I just it was so unexpected I don't know why it was unexpected but it was so unexpected and my friend who is straight size jumped in she's like oh no it's not and then launched <laughs> I was like I'm going to excuse myself. You educate this person. I'm getting another drink. And I was just like, oh, right. This is who I need by my side now. Because I can't, I'm exhausted. Are you not exhausted? I'm exhausted of always being the fat person talking about anti-fat bias. And, you know, and so just that moment I will never forget because it was the first time that had happened publicly. And that was just this past summer. Mm. Oh, that must have been like, because I, you would think that person's a safe person. They're into human yes, rights. Yes, I totally, I made a huge assumption. Yeah. 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 You know what? Something that is, I find, um, I don't know if this is, this is helpful or true for everyone, is that um, when I was newer in my fat liberation journey, I was, it was very difficult and I, it was very painful. And I was, I was angry a lot of the time at everything because obviously <laughs> everything it needed to be angry at because it's fucked up. And now, um, I've able to give myself some type of distance because I knew that that wasn't, I didn't like that feeling for myself all of the time, which was a natural feeling. I don't think it's a bad thing to feel like that. And now being uh, non-binary and be, I've been non-binary for a couple of years now. And so it's a newer journey. And I find myself having those same feelings of exhaustion and anger and frustration that I did around the fat stuff. And I think that's just because I'm newer and I'm like, well, hello, everyone. Why don't you, you know, get on board with the whole trans thing? And, um, I hadn't necessarily, um, at at the moment, I don't necessarily have the huge, uh, community around me that I currently do. And so my exposure to that anti-fat stuff is, is limited. And when it does happen, I'm more like, um, wow, I feel sorry for that person type of thing. Um, and also will be annoyed, but, but I don't know if that's, that's true for everyone that there's a kind of, and I'm, anger is so important, right? We need it to to be motivated to do things. So, so yeah, I'm I'm interested in that. Yeah, I love that idea of having a bit of distance, so I don't get so immediately. I think it's the shock of it. I still get activated by the surprise um, of when my I I guess it's anyway. It's something I think a lot about because I 
I do pretty quickly go to anger and like good anger, like that good fuel anger. And like, I will educate you, doctor who just told me it's as simple as calories and calorie is out. Let me tell you things. And like, I think I just, I, you know, I kind of, I still kind of come at people as opposed to what I could just do for myself or my own, you know, peace of mind would just be like, all right, that's their belief. It doesn't need to impact me. Here's how I can show up and still get what I need. But I'm, it's funny. I don't know. I, I hope I can get there. I think that's one of my hopes for myself <laughs> is to be able to just sink in and not need to, the, need to feel like I have to change people's minds in some way. Cause that's me. That's my stuff, you know? Yeah. But it, it, it's so hard though, because it's like we've had this like, Ah, moment, you know, the sun shining down and, you know, <laughs> the birds flying and whatever, where we needed someone to say, hey, did you know? And then it it changed everything for us. And I I always think maybe I'll be that for someone else. And maybe, but more likely than not, they, they are not ready to hear that message. And they're going to be like, Vinny is a fucking idiot. And Vinny is, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about, but or there's the fat person trying to defend their fatness, which is I've, what I've actually heard from family members of mine. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, boundary. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And you know what? It's I think it's it's just a sign of how compassionate we are to work towards others that we want to talk about it, and it shows to w- what what caring uh, people that we are. Um, and also, I want to extend that care for myself. And and the only the only reason that I learned this is because of hundreds and thousands of comments over the year on 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 my instagram and you know first being like fuck you you piece of shit you know i'm i get out of here i hate you and then being like i'm gonna educate them and i'm gonna have them have this ah! moment of <laughs> oh my god Vinny's right and so then i'd leave you know comments with links and evidence and la 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 and then they would come back and say fuck you and then fuck you you fat bitch as well yeah 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 and then i was like you know what? I'm just going to block them. And that's where I'm at right now is, and I've been there for a few years of, I'm just going to block them. Can't be bothered with these people. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Oh, there's so much in there. So one of the, what, what I'm very excited to chat with you about is something that is deeply vulnerable. And I think a lot of people encounter this in of all body sizes, and we'll talk specifically about what it's like in a larger or fat body, which is when you feel like your partner is not attracted to you because of your body. And I, as we were talking about this, I remembered the first time I heard about this was a friend of mine from university. I think we were in freshman year. Um, so first year university and we were gym buddies and we were going to the gym and she had mentioned, it's funny, I haven't thought about this in like, I don't know, how long was university? 20 years. Um, <laughs> that her partner had told her like the day before that he'd noticed she'd gained a little bit of weight. Now she was very straight size, like she was not plus size at all had told her he'd noticed she'd gain a little bit of weight and he was feeling a lot less attracted to her. And she was fully as, I mean, I absolutely get, I have been there too, like in a full shame spiral. Mm -hmm. And so of course it was, well, I'm going to stop eating. I'm going to work out and I'm going to, you know, become attractive. And oh, that memory just came back and the pain that she experienced and the the heartbreak of it. And I remember being very confused, not sure how to support her. I, th- I think it brought up a lot of stuff for me around my own body, which kind of even, I, I just remember being very confused <laughs> emotionally in that moment of how could he do this? Oh my God, but she's beautiful. Why did I, and like, again, this is, I was, what was I, 18? Like I knew nothing, um, but it, it was, I just felt the shame of it and her shame had me feel shame about my bigger body. And it just, it just one comment from a partner about desirability yeah, throws people completely. So I really want to dive into this with you from the perspective of people in fat bodies who are already defying beauty 
culture norms, diet culture ideals. Um, and God, what do we do with that if that happens or if we suspect it? And how do we not make ourselves wrong? Yeah. Oh, it's such a powerful topic. And and um, as you mentioned before, th- I had this experience too. And another memory that's seared in my in my in my brain of of being at um, a local park and the the pond being frozen over and the ducks trying to kind of sit on top of the frozen lake and and my my boyfriend um, of I guess at, at that point like four or five years we were together for six years in total um, confessing this terrible thing which was. I'm less attracted to you. And immediately I I thanked him for for sharing his his thoughts and his genuine desire for me to be quote better and I vow to him I'm going to be better for you. And that was the last diet I ever went on and it was kind of like a half-hearted attempt because so in the back of my mind I knew that there was something not right about this because of the years of therapy. Thank, thank fuck I had that. And I'm very lucky to have had that. Um, but I, I knew it was a problem with me. Like I knew I had something wrong in my body. And I knew that he was so kind for being so vulnerable to tell me I'm less attractive. Oh my God. You're making me sweat right now. Cause I'm like, I have felt that exact same thing. And now as a little more old and wise, I'm like so embarrassed. Like, how did I think those things? So I'm like sweating. I'm literally sweating. (laughs) Because what has society taught us is that women and femmes um, are objects for their partners to consume. That's our job is to be uh, trophies for them. Um, and we're failing at our number one job to be the smoke show, sex on legs, constantly horny and beautiful and thin, no matter what, no matter if we have children, no matter if we age, no matter if we're sick or disabled. Um, and that's not real life. And so now, now that I've gone through all of this, if if I could go back in time, and just replace, you know, be there, be in, be in my brain. I would be, I would say to him, Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate that. So, um, what are you going to do about the fact that you objectify me? And what are you going to do about the fact that you are so deep in anti-fat bias that you thought it was appropriate to say this to the person that you claim to love so deeply? Um, this is a you problem. You better get to therapy. You better get reading books. You better get listening to podcasts because this is not acceptable. Go fuck yourself. Yes. Oh my God. Snaps. All of it. (laughs) Right. Oh, can you imagine have had, have had, what's, I can't even talk. I'm like so overwhelmed by it. Having had that kind of ability in that moment to say that. And, you know, this is hindsight and this is, you know, I'm, I'm away from, I've got distance from it. You know, I probably would still be, you know, in that moment, it probably wouldn't be possible for me to say that because I'd probably be crying, being like, I'm sorry, I'll be vain, you know, but, <laughs> but now I have that, that ability to say those things um, in my brain, imaginary. Uh, but obviously in that situation, it's so fucking hard because you're, you love this person and you want them to think that you are attractive. And uh, as a, a knock-on effect from that, if I uh, stayed in a relationship with him, would I have ever believed that he thought I was attractive again? Hell no. Even if he said, you are so attractive. Even if I had lost weight, I'd be terrified of putting on a pound. It's like the trust is gone. Yeah. Yeah. But he is there consuming my body. And um, after the relationship, I um, I asked him, um, would you have been more happy in the relationship if I had a thin body? And he said, yes. And I said, why? And he re- he really took some time to think about it. And he said, well, because then, you know, the people at work would see me with you and think that I'm a better person. Fuck. And I was like, wow. Oh. Thank you for that. Thank you. I mean, kudos to this person for being honest. You know, a lot of people wouldn't even be able to say that truth. 
but fuck. Yeah. And I think now I'm like, I feel really sorry. He's in a new relationship where his spouse is fat and um, they have had a child. And I just think poor, poor her that she has to deal with that. And also poor him. He's never going to be satisfied with his spouse's looks, his partner's look until he unlearns patriarchy, uh, sexism, racism, anti-fatness, all of that stuff. And, but men, I feel like men are not able to see that that it's a them problem. They think it's a woman problem or their partner problem. And it's wrong. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah. I'm just thinking about my current, my, my partner now, my husband, um, <laughs> he's gone through a big journey, uh, as I've been, sharing a lot about anti-oppression work, fat liberation. When we met, he didn't really, he, he's very, uh, he's an artist. So he's always been kind of outside the bounds of societal structures anyway, I think, which is one of the reasons why we work well, but he's had to, he's had to do some learning as well. Like when I say, weight stigma and oh I'm nervous to go to the doctor and he's like why I'm like okay you know when we were first dating that was a legit question now he's like oh okay how can I support you you're going to the doctor today like what do you need like he's had to to basically kind of be on a journey with me as well yeah and I'm so grateful for that because I've been I've had lots of other relationships where that was not the case where Mm. my body um whether it was said or not, there were a lot of times where I could feel the other person's um, views on my body. Yeah. You know, especially out with people and yeah. Yeah. I think that we, there's hints that it's, if someone is uh, truly, um, you know, pro-fat and pro, pro-fat liberation, you'll know it they'll talk about it and they'll talk about um you know that that oppression and politics around it or they don't know about it and they you know talk about how all bodies are beautiful and all that type of stuff or they'll be like you know who i really what who i really fancy is kim kardashian or i really want to have sex with this celebrity and then you're like "Mm mm-hmm okay i know that you uh (laughs) I just can't. I can't even with that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Or you know what people do a lot of times in the beginning of relationships, they'll be like, so what's your type? Or like on a date one. And then that fucks people up forever because um, what if then your partner says, oh, I'm really into like um, long blonde hair and, you know, oh, yeah, um, oh, Megan Fox, so I really like her. Or, you know, then you'll be like looking at your body, even if you are the doppelganger of Megan Fox and be like, yeah, um, I'm not quite Megan Fox, so I'm a disappointment to them. And you know what's so interesting? I don't think it goes the other way. I don't think no. men have those same concerns. Like I would, I had... Yeah, it just, it's very one-sided. Yeah, because men have been taught that their value in society is to be uh, producing money, to to be using violence, um, and to not expressing their emotions and all that type of stuff. And so, um, yeah, it's, it, although that's not universal, I'm sure a lot of men probably think, oh my God, my spouse is attracted to, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever, right. and then I'm not looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Yeah, but it's probably a lot less, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and I want to, I, I was just, as we've been talking about this, I was realizing there's a part of this conversation that I actually also need to own myself, which is that when I was deep in my own internalized fat phobia, I treated partners that were fat in a way that I'm very ashamed of now. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what? Like when I was... um hating my own body and I was with someone who was was bigger who was fat I I hated on his body too what like in your brain or- in my brain but also like I would say things I was still into like di- trying to diet and try to figure stuff out and but it was almost like my frustration my within my version of this my frustration with myself would come out towards him so I would say things like 
oh God, I, it's so embarrassing. I'm like, it's just, it's horrible. And I'm so sorry that I ever did this, but I would say things like, you know, do you like, do you really need to eat that? I can't believe I said that to someone, Vinny, like, or I would, I would, I would like make not so subtle comments about like, ah, oh, like you're just taking up like all the space, you know, ah. I know, I know. And when I think about, I mean, I've thought about this a lot because that there was a lot of work. I mean, obviously I, a lot of work I had to do to, to unlearn my own internalized fat phobia. I'm so, I've, I'm mostly forgiving myself because you kind of have to, but God, I, I, I did cause pain. I'm sure, I'm sure, um, on people where I did that to them. And it, it what's so interesting is that it, it really truly wasn't about them. It was my own frustration with my own body and they represented like a mirror of my body. And so I kind of took out on them what actually was about me. Oh, it was so fucked up. Like God, diet culture just fucks us up so deeply. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And it's, I think it's so cool that you like recognize and remember those things. Um, well, for me, I would not date a fat person. Like, I wouldn't even, so that would be my shame of like, I would always go after the most possibly um, like, uh, you know, straight sized man, uh, tall, um, has this social capital to prove that I am worthy. Yes, I get that. That's fucked up. And so, you know, I wouldn't have even been, if I had been with a fat person, mm -hmm. I would probably be saying that shit too. Yeah. But I was so anti-fat that I wouldn't even be with a fat person. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So if someone is in a relationship where they are feeling maybe their body has changed, maybe they've always been fat, maybe they're going through their own, I'll do your ah moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's, what are some of the things that can be true for them? How do they, how do they, how do they be in this moment in this situation where they're worried about this if, if they if they're worried that their their spouse secretly is unattracted to them yeah i mean it's hard when we've just spoken about all of these terrible situations where we have been anti-fat and uh, spouses have been anti-fat um thing is though i just want to preface this with by saying that not every person is in the world is anti-fat right there are many people out there who um love fat bodies who um who appreciate their spouse no matter what their body looks like okay um and that is that exists yes i mean my partner is one of them one of our early i'll just share one of my er oh, oh, okay sweetheart don't listen to this episode um <laughs> you might be embarrassed but it was a huge moment in our relationship um and we've been together f almost four years so and we're in our we're in our 40s. So it's, you know, we've both have been married before and had long relationships. So both of us were, were very clear on what we were looking for. We'd both done a lot of our own work. But one of our early conversations was around like, I, it was so funny. I don't know. Again, it's so funny to think about these conversations now where I was like, we're sitting on my couch and I looked at him and I said, you know, like, and we'd already been together. We'd slept together. You know, we, we were, you know, maybe a month or two in. And I was like, you know, and I was kind of, I remember, I think I kind of like ducked my head a little bit. I kind of like looked up at him. I don't know. I was in this, that kind of energy of, is it okay that my body is the way it is? And I remember he looked at me and he's like, I, I like, he was shocked. He's like, I love your body. I'm attracted to larger bodies. I find them beautiful. And they're just, it's, I've, I've always been drawn to bodies that have curves. And I was like, and I remember being like, what? And he's like, how did you not know that? I'm like, how did you not tell me that? Like, we'd spent like <laughs> you know, a month or two together. And I, me being, I don't know if I was still in that, like thinking, does he know I'm fat? I'm like, of course he knows. But you know, that, <laughs> oh, it's so messy. It can get so messy. Um, and and it's in, it, that's really interesting because one of the things that has come up, and we can maybe talk about this too as well, is like, there are people who appreciate all bodies. There are people who appreciate larger bodies. And then there's when it becomes fetish, which is a whole other thing, right? And I'm always really curious about the interplay of that. And anyway, but 
there are people and I've and I when I was dating um there were lots of people I just want to give people hope basically because I hear from a lot of fat people who are like no one will ever love my body I'm like no no there are people who love your body exactly as it is and yeah so shout out to all those people they are out there this, there's, a, there's, there's a stat and it's from from straight people um, that 25% of men uh, would date a fat woman. And so if we think about 25% and it's like, it sucks that it's not 100%, but if we think about on the planet, there are 8 billion people. Let's just say 50% of them are, you know, people that are straight. So 4 billion. And then let's just say that, um, you know, one billion of them are people that are in the right age category. And let's just go wild and just say one million people are the eligible for whatever reason. So of one million people, 250,000 people want to be with you, theoretically. 250,000 penises flying <laughs> at you. Can you handle that? That's a lot of penis. <laughs> That's not a dick, right? Like, and if you're a straight person looking for penis, like, I mean, I mean, I can gobble a dick or two, but not 250,000. Do you know what I mean? So if we think about it like that, and some people will be like, well, I'm in a small community, but it's still more than zero. It's a uh, totally more than zero. Yeah. It's more than zero. And there's going to be people who are, who are like, I would kill to go on a date with this person. I would kill to have sex with this person. I'd kill to be in love with this person. And it's more than zero. And um, and obviously there's lots of different things, situations and barriers and all that type of stuff, but it is always more than zero. So um, so just yeah, keeping that in mind of can you handle 250,000 dicks or, you know, uh, a JJ or whatever it is that you're, 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 uh, you're interested in. That's the new dating mantra. Everyone take it with you. <laughs> well, can you handle 2,000 genitals, 250,000 genitals coming at you? You might swatting them off with a bat or something, a tennis racket. <laughs> no more. I can't handle any more genitals. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> do you know what's so interesting too? I just wanted to give a shout out because I do have a lot of straight size mm -hmm. listeners. And as we're talking about this, we're talking about obviously the context of fatness, but I know that almost, I mean, most people I know, I would gather, I would bet almost everybody listening will have had those moments of, oh my God, this person is about to see me naked. They're going to hate X, Y, Z about my body because I hate X, Y, Z about my body. So this is like, this is a really universal thing that diet culture does to us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and the thing is, like, if I'm going to see someone naked from the perspective of someone who doesn't care being naked and I don't think about my body like that, I'm just excited to, like, see them naked and have sex with them or play around with them. I'm not thinking, oh, my God, look at their, like, weird belly button or look at, you know, whatever. I'm just like, oh, cool. There's a human body. I'm attracted to it with clothes on. I'm attracted to it when I saw them on the dating profile. You know, it, so I'm not suddenly going to be like, holy shit, you have a human body under there. I don't want to have sex with that. I thought that uh, a model was going to walk in here with, with you know, photoshopped and perfect lighting and all that type of stuff. And if you've ever had, if you've had sex a couple of times, your partner knows every inch of your body, knows close up details of what your asshole looks like. And so you never need to worry about being naked in front of them again, because They've got a mental image image in their brain of every inch of you and they like it. Just like you do of them. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I mean, I can't really I can't picture many of my ex's assholes though. So I mean, maybe that wasn't a good example. <laughs> I wasn't really looking that much at their assholes. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my thing. I was looking at other things. But, other things. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so going back to this, like, um, you know, we've been talking about this, all these bad experiences. And so, um, when we're thinking about, uh, do, is my spouse actually attracted to me? And they say, oh, you're so good looking. You're so beautiful. You're so handsome, whatever. Um, and we're like, mm, is it true? And there, for many different reasons, we can feel like it's not true. And so the three different scenarios in this, if you don't believe that your partner is attracted to you, is the first scenario is that they're lying. And they're lying because they are such 
a charitable human being. It is their their life's mission to date really, really ugly people. And you happen to be the one that they found and they're planning on going to heaven and their charity work is to fuck someone disgusting and commit their lives to them. Um, or or they're after you for your millions of dollars and they, you know, they are, they're, they're a bad person that way. And so that first scenario of they're actually lying is pretty unlikely, right? <laughs> like, but that's what I always thought. I always thought my ex, the one that was told me that I was too fat, that he was such a kind guy, but he dated me because of my personality. He dated me because I was funny. He dated me because, and he overlooked my fatness because he was such a nice guy. No, he was also attracted to me. He also wanted to fuck me. He also was like, fucking hell, look at those tits or whatever, you know? And uh, up until the point when he was like, you know, I'm not attracted to you anymore. Um, so that's not true. And I think a lot of people think my spouse is just nice. They're just nice. They're just saying that to be nice. It's not true. And so the next scenario is they're telling the truth. They're attracted to you. Um, and I like to think about, um, you know, what are we doing when we're, if our spouse is like, uh, our partner is saying, I'm really attracted to you. And we say, oh, God, why? Oh, no, my body's horrible. Are we yucking their yum? I don't know if everyone's familiar with that phrase of they're saying this is this is something amazing and delicious. And we're saying, ew, gross. You shouldn't be attracted to that because it's disgusting. The impact that has, the more we do that, that starts to often starts to change. First of all, it shuts them down because giving someone a compliment is vulnerable no matter what. And then they stop saying it. And then you, and then everyone, it's like floating in the air and everyone is kind of believing it's true. You can actually start to shift your partner's perception with that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a real barrier to connection. As opposed to receiving and saying, thank you. We have a hard time receiving also. And so the third scenario here is that maybe something else is going on. So m you maybe you're not believing them because in the past they've expressed anti-fat attitudes or you know that they watch a lot of misogynistic porn or um, or maybe something else is going on, like your partner is um, on the asexual spectrum, which is having low or no desire um, for sex, or or maybe they're tired, or maybe they're not bothered, maybe they are depressed, maybe they need to go to therapy, you know, maybe lots of different things. Because a lot of times people say to me, clients say to me, well, they're not initiating sex, it's always me. And so what could be going on? Is it that they're not attracted to you? Maybe. Probably, uh, who knows? But also, there could be a laundry list of other things going on. And so, in that situation, um, communicating with them and, and working out what is going on um, would be really, really helpful. The book um, written by Emily Nagoski called Come As You Are talks a lot about the breaks that actually get in the way of having desire. And it's things like stress, medication. I'm on. Um, Vizane, which is a anti-estrogen, a progestin type drug right now for endometriosis. And it has, I've always had very high libido. It has taken it away. Oh. And it's very weird to not like always want to pounce on my partner because like I've spent my whole life pouncing. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it, so there's so many things that can happen. They go on an antidepressant that takes away libido, you know, like, so that's a great book. If anyone's interested in exploring what those, Emily calls them breaks. So what those breaks could be that are, and then how to, and that we focus on the wrong thing. We put on lingerie, we get, we do a date night, we light candles as opposed to, okay, actually that my partner is really stressed out. Let's actually do some work around that. And then that will naturally open them up to, to feeling, wanting to feel intimate, wanting to feel connected in that way. So, yeah, I think a lot about that, like what's underneath this. Mm -hmm. And how easy would it be for your husband to be like, oh my God, Sophia used to pounce on me all the time and now it's because of my body. I know. Because we're so good at making it about us, right? I know. And I'm really lucky because we basically, we had to have a conversation. I said, you know, this thing has happened and I'm very surprised by it. I kind of, I'm kind of grappling with it. So we have a whole thing now where 
I'll say, okay, I'm like, all right, baby, you got to rev my motor. (laughs) (laughs) And they'll start kissing me the way I like. And then that takes care. And then that allows me to like, to, you know, be very excited to get intimate. But that, that initial drive is gone and it's, it's, it's very disconcerting. Um, So again, I think a lot of times the conversations Mm -hmm. with our have cultivating the ability to have really open, really vulnerable conversations with our partners is so important around this stuff. I don't know, especially as we get older, I'm really noticing this as we move into our mid to late forties, um, bodies start to change in weird ways, Mm -hmm. especially around intimacy. That communication part, exactly what you, like you say, and and it could be that say if your spouse is attracted to you, which is probably the most likely scenario because uh, how often is it that we're in a relationship with someone that we're not attracted to? Um, and um, But you're not feeling it for whatever reason, asking them to maybe uh, do certain things or say certain things. But also, it's so annoying, but a lot of this stuff has to come from us. It's so fucking annoying. Like, why can't we just, you know, hear that we're attractive and then just be like, okay, cool, done. You know, so we have to... We have to believe it really deeply. And a lot of times people can say, I know that fat bodies are attractive. I can see it with my eyes that um, these people who are who are fat are attractive. I can't see it for myself. My body isn't because there's something deeply flawed about my body. And for me, I'm like, ooh, ding, ding, ding. That's a real clue that you have um fat phobia lurking in that gorgeous brain of yours and it's really um pointing inwards um and it also tells me that they've already done a lot of work in regards to the way that they view fatness and so that's that's really promising versus if they were like all fat people are disgusting then that's kind of starting from the beginning right right so if someone is having that ding 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 moment in this right now what would you suggest to them, Vinny? Like, what would you have them begin to think about, explore, do? Yeah. So I think the uh, positioning of fat bodies as um, attractive, as sexy, as lovable, as worthy um, through consuming images of fatness in, um, you know, in sexual situations and in, in sensual situations Um and getting all those types of images into our brain, uh, understanding desirability and doing more learning around that. Um, and um, if there's any hangups in regards to uh, what do I believe about fatness? Like, is it that I just believe that my fat body is unattractive? Is it that I also believe that I'm unhealthy? Is it also that I believe that um, fat people are lazy or whatever. Like what other anti-fat beliefs do you have and what resources can you search out that talk about that um, and dispel those myths? Um, so, and then if you, if you can talk about this and if you have a therapist or, or other groups of fat people, or if it's also, can you frame your body, your fat body as desirable? And so things like um, uh, Vivian McMaster has a program program called be your own beloved which yeah, is she was a guest on the podcast it's brilliant yeah her program's great i've done her program and it starts out with taking pictures of of yourself of you know first you know it's like take a picture of your toes and take a picture of your silhouette in shadow take a picture you know and so it's starting it's not like okay so take a full frontal of you you in split crotch panties you know because then that would be traumatizing <laughs> I kind of wish that was the first yeah, one. Yeah, the first one. Okay, everybody, get those cameras ready. Oh, that's so good. My best friend and I did her seven day take your selfie for yourself over the holiday. And we did, and it was that kind of progression. It was really beautiful to be intentional around us, our bodies in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And we both had lots of really beautiful insights out of it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's like really framing yourself as as maybe in a way that you've not seen yourself before because you were at you know naturally believing that your body is bad because we've all spent our whole lives being told that our body is bad. Um, so it could be that you're already on the journey, but you just need to keep you know being intentional about 
what you're consuming? And also, um, are you doing things that um, convince you that your body is bad? So, for example, watching, um, I don't know, Love Island or, you know, sexy bikini babes on the beach dating show. I've been doing this work for years and I still will notice that there are certain triggers for me to make me feel like a bag of shit. Yeah. Spending 12 hours watching Bikini Babes on the Beach dating show will do it because my brain is like, that's what your body should look like. I see my body in a mirror and my brain automatically says, wrong. And it's just an automatic thing. And intellectually, I can say, uh, brain, I don't think so. And But I have to support my brain with with consuming content that, is helpful and not to say you can't watch that stuff but notice that you might need to put in good fat stuff you know yeah um and in terms of porn a little recommendation is a website called make love not porn i don't know if you're familiar with that Vinny. it's a great site lots of body diversity it's member generated content it's it's not like the it's it's very like everything that Pornhub is not and it's still very, very sexy, and it's a great source for diverse viewing of bodies in ecstasy. And I think that's really Im- important because a lot of the times when we are viewing uh, sex and eroticism, it's thin bodies, it's white bodies, it's non-disabled bodies, and they're all being a lot of the the female bodies are being like dominated, and you know, like there's a there's a misogyny to it. Oh, massively, like deeply violent. Um, not the way that humans really have sex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put links to Make Love Not Porn and Be Your Own Beloved in the show notes. So if anyone's curious about either of those, go check out the notes. They are there. Vinny, what are there, is there any other advice that you have for people in this situation? Anything else you would want Mm -hmm. them to know or hear? Maybe some words of wisdom. I think if you're with a partner who is not on board with this stuff, who's not committed to this stuff. Um, and you're worried, like, but who else is going to date me? Like, I can't not be in this relationship that there are so many people that want to date you. There's, there, there is an alternative reality out there that you don't have to accept someone that doesn't make you feel wonderful, you know? And I think we're, we're so used to accepting that as fat people that, well, what can, you know, I'm fat. So therefore I, I, I will put it up with a lot of shit. I mean, I did in my life. Um, and also it doesn't mean that it's doomed too. Like, like exactly what you were saying about your husband. How beautiful is that? That he's come along and he's been an advocate and, you know, you know, we're talking about romantic partners, but then also, um, you know, like my mum, who, who would have thought that that would have been the, the situation. And so who knows? But also, if your partner is saying, no, I really am attracted to you, then I believe them. Trust them. Trust them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Before we go, though, Vinny, you've got a really exciting offering um, that you're doing. You are going to take a group of fat people to Dominicans. Do you want to tell Tell us a little bit about that. I'm so, and I'm so curious about the impetus for this. What what had you want to do this? What's it going to be like to be on vacation? Because I've actually never, I think most of my, I'm not often in, in real life, virtually, yes, but in real life in groups of fat people, which is a weird thing, right? Because, I mean, we do this work, I think, talk you know it's like my life and but I'm not and I'm so wanting that I'm very desirous of it so I love that you're creating it and I just would love for you to share yeah so um me too it's in Vancouver we have a lot of thin kind of yogi type people here and um not that many fat people unfortunately I mean they're there we're just uh, not as many um and I only get together with groups of fat people maybe once or twice a year, or maybe twice or three times a year for plus size clothing swaps. And um, the the joy and community from going to those events, just being with other fat people is is 
wonderful. It really is nourishing for my brain. So I've been wanting to do a trip with fat folks for a long time. It's been on my on my kind of brain of how can I make this happen? And and luckily there's a, a company that approached me called Trova Trip who who organize everything and you just kind of put it out to your organ- audience. And I spoke to them and I really was like, well, I, I need the trip to be fat positive. And they were like, we've got you. We have They knew what trip. that meant? They are so political. They were like, they were like, oh yeah, we've worked with this person, that person, this person. We've got, we can tell you the size of the towels. We can tell you what the weight limits are. We can tell you what the seating is like. We can, I was like, get the fuck out of here. Yes, yes, People yes. People are actually thinking about this. Yes. <gasps> oh my God. You've just given me so much hope. I know. Yeah. Cause I was like, hey, you know, I, I, I'm fat positive thinking that they'll be like, What's that? Thing? What's that? Yes. But they were like, "Oh yeah, no, uh, we've you know we know all about it," and was telling me, th- and I was like, "Get out, get out! This is amazing. <laughs> That's um, amazing! Yeah, yeah." So we we've we've, uh, we've got it's five days in the Dominican Republic, June fourteenth to eighteenth. Um. Oh my goodness! Do you know what the theme of the vacation is? Fat joy. <gasps> what? I know. What? Well, wow. isn't that? <laughs> <laughs> that um, is perfect <laughs> yeah so yay fat so joy a, yay fat <laughs> joy it's accessible to those with limited mobility or folks with disabilities as well as non-disabled uh, fat folks um and we're doing activities together that have been vetted in advance to make sure that they're safe and fun for fat folks so we've got things like um Ah, oh, going to to um, beach club, going to um, uh, indigenous ecological park, going swimming with baby sharks. Um, oh God, Vinny, I want to come so bad. I know. <laughs> oh my God, I'm just dying. Um, yeah, and it's just going to be so wonderful and um, just a, such a, a, a fun laughter, joy. You know, and so, yeah, if you can come, then that would be amazing. Um, and go check out the link that you'll find with the with the show notes or wherever you're going to put that link. I'm so glad you're doing this. I think it's so important to gather and to be in as safe as possible spaces, you know, because we don't we don't get that a lot. Or at least I feel like I don't get that a lot outside of my own home. Yeah. And and as well, the uh, we I chose Dominican Republic because Southwest fly there, and Southwest has a customer of size policy where you can get uh, extra seats for free. That's great. They do such a good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With that. So, so how do you, Vinny, stay connected to joy? How do you attune to fat joy? Well, I um, I like. Uh, doing things that kind of uh would make my younger self happy so for example um i go roller skating and when i was a kid i lived in these damn roller skates i like li- literally would we- go to church wearing roller skates i remember <laughs> roller skating through wet concrete like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> but as an adult it's like well you know can fat people do that yes yes um and so doing things that that really um fill me up um and also with the unlearning of white supremacy um is getting rid of all of that shame of of not doing stuff too and that joy for me doing things like having a big old fucking nap sleeping watching netflix doing some cross stitch you know that type of thing and so connecting with what my brain really wants outside of these oppressive ideals that i have internalized kind of yeah absolutely Oh, that's so good. You're making me think about Rest is Rebellious from Trisha Hersey, Trisha Hersey and the kind of anti-hustle culture. I mean, it's amazing how they're also intertwined to make us as robotic as possible. Yeah. And there's a book I read recently, uh, Laziness is a Myth or Laziness is a Lie. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, this awesome trans author. Um, yeah. I'm going to check that out. Because that was the um, that was the bad word in our household growing up. You can't be lazy. 
children of immigrants, like you cannot be lazy. What are you doing? You what my mum would always always call me lazy lump. And I tell my mum all the time, she's like, I've done nothing today. And I'll be like, I say, I do not believe you. And she'll be like, well, you know, I cooked a three course dinner and I did 17 loads of laundry and, you know, I did and, and ran a marathon, but I've done nothing. And I'm like, that you're lying. <sighs> I know. Same with my parents. They, they, I'm like, you've retired. Now you get to not work the hundred hour weeks you used to work. And they, they just can't. They're always puttering they're puttering here and they're puttering here and they're doing this and and then and my mom will say the same thing oh I just I did nothing today and like feel terror and but but and genuinely feel terrible about herself and I'm like that's good you're 70 something you you don't have to do something all the time oh my god and that's like that and that's me this constant struggle in my brain of oh well what have you done with your day and because I'm so I've really internalized all that stuff Mm mm-hmm yeah, my family. Yeah, for decades of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, I love that you are joyfully taking naps and cross stitching and roller skating. That sounds so delightful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vinny, it's been such a joy to talk to you. I'm so glad to have connected again. And you're just a fountain of fat elder wisdom. Oh, thank you, Sophia. Thank you for having me. It's been great to talk to you too. Before we go, I'd like to read a poem because poetry can reach our hearts in a different way. Poems can have us feel in a different way. And that's what this podcast is all about. Expanding our hearts, deepening our empathy, and inviting in joy. So each week, you get a new poem. Vinnie Wells B is one of the fat elders who helped me along my own liberation journey, who helped me to see beyond what patriarchy and diet culture and white supremacy told me was the ideal. And so this poem by Melissa Studdard felt perfect for my episode with Vinny. It's called Pinot Grigio is a Concept. And my body is a collection of rivers that think they are bones. I love my blood the way I love pink cherry soda, the way I would nibble on my own earlobes and call it good breeding. According to Eduardo Galeno, the church says the body is a sin. Science says it's a machine and advertising has tried to make it into a business. But the body says I am a fiesta. That's why both my elbows think they are wishbones, and all my knuckles have decided to be opals, increasingly iridescent with every change of angle. That's why every glass of Pinot Grigio I drink is a toast to the diamonds in your and my and Maya Angelou's thighs. Big, small, and all the in-betweens are perfect to me. Even when what I see in the mirror makes me want to cry, I remember the glory of the aqueducts that would deliver those waters from the vast countryside of my insecurity out to the glamorous cities of my cheeks. And suddenly my body is an event to be marked by festivities, the best year yet of an award-winning vineyard, a half-century-long firework display, a pilgrimage, a parade. Thank you for joining me today. My hope is that you're feeling a little less alone and a little more seen. So until the next episode, you can find me on Instagram at fatjoy.life, on YouTube at youtube.com slash at fatjoy, and on Patreon at patreon.com slash fatjoy. Please do check out the show notes for how you can connect with my amazing guest and for the links to the poem. All right, lovely. I am sending you off with my best wishes for an abundantly fat joy day. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye-bye.